And we're back to this again. Ay ay ay. Okay, so I said I wouldn't add much to this whole Paper Mario ordeal anymore after my last video. I did say Paper Mario content would still be a thing, but I was so confident in that being the end of me discussing Modern Paper Mario for like the next three or four years or so. But there's an interview from a month ago that's only now making rounds that did deserve a much smaller video of its own, since it would have fit completely comfortably in why Paper Mario refuses to change. For anyone new to the channel or who may not have seen it, I made a dummy long video talking about the entire Paper Mario debacle, the development cycles and research involving its changes and or stagnation in some areas. This interview popping up more lately I'm covering today answers some questions and topics discussed in that video. I cannot stress enough how much I recommend that video, I spent several days on it and a lot of research and care was put into it, far more than why Paper Mario changed. Like I genuinely consider it my best video on the channel at the moment, I guess my peak, my apex or magnum opus in complaining about Paper Mario. But I genuinely want that video to reach more people. I'm super proud of it for anyone who hasn't seen it, anyone new to the channel or Paper Mario, I recommend giving it a watch. If it's too long, which I can understand being a turn off, you can watch it in chunks, there are timestamps for a chunk load, but I at least hope the consideration's there. Best video on the channel, better than why Paper Mario changed, go watch it, won't disappoint. So because of that, I don't want to reiterate most of what I said in that video. We're just going to talk about this specific interview. It's not just solely me giving an excuse to milk more Paper Mario content out of me. This one answers a few questions and topics pertaining to that video, while also leaving more questions. This would have gone great with that video, but I didn't catch it until now. It's better late than never, I suppose. So the interview itself was released July 21st last month, a little after the Origami King. Comes from Eurogamer and is translated from German, so again, apologies for any lost translation or mistranslation at play. It involves Kensuke Tanabe and Masahiko Nagaya, and we'll cover each bit paragraph by paragraph slash topic by topic here. It starts with Eurogamer asking Tanabe, and I quote, Paper Mario, Kirby, and the Rainbow Brush, aka Rainbow Curse, Yoshi's Woolly World, and Nintendo Labo. Nintendo seems to have a real soft spot for handicrafts and likes to use materials and fabrics from the real world. Is that a coincidence or is there a certain philosophy behind it? Kensuke Tanabe responds, Back when we started developing the first Paper Mario game here at Intelligent Systems, we couldn't commit ourselves to one graphic style for a while. One day, Mr. Miyamoto saw a picture of paper-thin Mario characters designed by Naohiko Aoyama. He said, okay, let's take this one. And so we had a graphic style. From then on, paper became a central theme of the series for both game design and graphics. In the case of the Kirby and Yoshi titles, the consideration was different. We recognized that the new hardware and the associated improved graphics performance would enable the implementation of a tinkering concept that would emphasize the character of the games even more. At Paper Mario, the approach was different as the paper issue was in the foreground from the start. With the improved performance of the new hardware, we're now able to implement the graphics we envisioned. And that brings us to Paper Mario the Origami King. Eurogamer also asked, did the work on Labo also influence the idea of using origami as a game idea for the new Paper Mario? The response from Tanabe was, the first concept we came up with for the Origami King was paper mache. Mr. Aoyama of Intelligent Systems suggested creating an environment using pieces of paper glued to support frames. We also tried to come up with other elements that are more familiar and easier to implement. The team at Nintendo suggested origami as a concept, and based on that we developed the world of the Origami King. Nintendo Labo didn't have much influence on the development. These two specific parts isn't a whole lot. If you saw any of my Paper Mario videos within the past three years, you know that even with Origami King's strong presentation, I'm not a fan of the oversaturation and centralization of the paper mache look and influence. I'm not going to repeat why I feel the paper within Paper Mario was largely meant and accepted as an aesthetic and art style specifically, why it shouldn't be a forefront for near every gameplay mechanic, the story, the writing, etc. I've expressed my two cents enough on that more than enough already. This doesn't add or change a whole bunch, but this... This upcoming piece is a big one from this interview. The first two games are the most popular in series history, and these two have the most RPG elements. Origami King's not approaching this again. Why is that? Tanabe responds, One of our goals in developing Paper Mario Sticker Star was to move away from the traditional RPG style. Nintendo is another RPG series in which Mario is the main character. We wanted to differentiate ourselves from this by positioning our game as an adventure game with a focus on puzzle solving. Even if we kept this direction so far, we've not yet decided whether or not we will change it in the future. However, my personal opinion is that I would like to keep making Paper Mario games that are both innovative and unique. 
once again, again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Mario and Luigi alongside Paper Mario never clashed with each other. It was never a talking point until him and Tabata brought it up since Color Splash. And even then, Mario and Luigi, the entire Mario RPG genre, as far as we know anyways, is dead. Alpha Dream went under a year ago, Nintendo's currently sitting on the franchise. We have no idea if they're going to do anything with it now, and especially when the two never butted heads or went odds with neither their existences nor styles. It doesn't warrant completely stripping one of its RPG roots when they're not the same RPG. The only similarities they share are their RPGs within the Mario world. That's literally it. That's like saying we shouldn't have Zelda be an action-adventure game or Donkey Kong Country shouldn't be 2D platforming because 2D Mario exists and 3D Mario exists, and it's all ridiculous. Paper Mario's level of depth between the badges, the partners, the insane variety of attacks, and amount of strategy into the gameplay is not the same as Mario and Luigi's faster, real-time focused combat focused strictly around Mario and Luigi most of the time. The humor and charm of Mario and Luigi is more slapstick, visual, and cartoony. Paper Mario's, the first three anyways, focus more on grounded humor within the dialogue and character stories. Paper Mario focused more on realistic natural writing and storytelling, with higher stakes, focusing on largely completely new characters and worlds for Mario to interact with. Mario and Luigi focused on the core Mario cast, the Mario Bros themselves especially, in both new and old worlds with new and old characters, expanding Mario's lore and telling stories serving to strengthen the characters we come to know and love. Whether established anywhere within the Mario franchise in any other game, or specifically within Mario & Luigi. Once cartoonier than Mario usually is, focusing on more comedy and slapstick, giving these classic Mario characters more development and scenarios to interact in, and the gameplay centralized on the brothers' dynamics specifically. Paper Mario is more realistic and grounded in its world and storytelling, balancing both natural humor and serious tensions, delivering grander stakes than most other Mario games, putting Mario into many more new worlds with more new characters for Mario to interact with, and the gameplay significantly more traditional and packed with more strategy and depth than Mario & Luigi. I am so sick of this comparison being made, especially when A, they never interfere with each other at all, B, this was never a talking point or comparison until Color Splash, when Tabata brought it up. Not even a joke. No one tried dismissing one over the other, especially when both were fantastic series. And C, they're not one-to-one -one Mario RPGs to justify completely changing a series' entire genre, especially when those changes aren't good nor well-designed in most cases with Modern Paper Mario. It did not stop Mario Plus Rabbits from being designed as a tactical RPG. Miyamoto literally went to Ubisoft and approved them making a Mario and Rabbit RPG crossover. Even if it was a special crossover, no pre-existing Mario RPG series led to a contention of it not being an RPG. Why must he and other developers insist Paper Mario must have this contention? And then they claim they choose to deter from the RPG genre, yet they still bother bringing in partners even in a half-assed fashion. The battles are still turn-based, slow, and require thought and strategy, like every RPG out there. And yet there's a bigger focus on puzzles, yet not that many people outside the developers talk about the bigger focus on puzzles. It still has those RPG elements, only missing others, while trying to be an entirely different genre, with being designed after another different genre, for better or worse. And now they're unsure whether they should continue the direction or return to the roots or not. Despite everything fans and I have been saying since Sticker Star, like, now more than ever, the lack of distinction or identity of what Paper Mario is or should be is insane. You get why I keep comparing to Sonic, the major identity crisis Paper Mario is going through? Ludicrously frustrating. They genuinely lose nothing, if not almost entirely, honest to god, nothing, if they return to those roots. The fact that's been so heavily requested for a treasure trove of reasons, yet is ignored, is the annoying thing about this. The classic formula can still innovate and be unique. Once again, Bug Fables takes TTYD's formula and creates new ideas and mechanics that make it unique and innovative of that style. It stands on its own, even beyond not sharing the Mario brand because of it. Super Paper Mario didn't ditch the RPG roots even when it was a platformer, still introduced everything else the other two games had, and was unique and innovative because of its platforming hybrid creation along with the scope and story of it all. TTYD was a literal innovation of 64's entire foundation. More attacks, new partners with new abilities, new characters, a bigger, more epic story. Like, there are many ways they can still make that OG formula innovative and unique and stand out from old Paper Marios without compromising the genre, game design, and relationship with consumers and fans. It builds from there, unfortunately. From Eurogamer to Tanabe. 
Following on that, how do you develop a series further when so many fans want a return to familiar elements? Talk about how Origami King is an advancement. The game development philosophy that I inherited from Mr. Miyamoto aims to develop innovative and unique game systems. I am not against the opinions of the fans, however I consider my game development philosophy to be independent of that. If we kept using the same game system that the fans want, we wouldn't be able to surprise them or offer them new gaming experiences. We always try our best to find new ways to surpass expectations in surprising ways. At the same time, however, there is no guarantee that we will always succeed, so this is a real challenge. There's one fatal flaw with his philosophy he inherited from Miyamoto. It's that he doesn't have this philosophy anymore for like the third time. Miyamoto's involvement on a majority of games this past decade has been ridiculously little. I sourced an interview in Why Paper Mario Refuses to Change, where Miyamoto outright states he's trying to make Mario less rigid and more accessible and varied for many different experiences. The lack of story, RPG gameplay, and all that stuff, Miyamoto literally does not envision that rigid basic ideal anymore. Tanabe prioritizing his development philosophies as well confirms that essentially, yeah, screw fan feedback and criticism if it doesn't align with my ideals, which is again unhealthy and destructively frustrating. One of the most basic relationships businesses establish is with their consumer. Based on that feedback, the information, insights, reviews, critiques, and whatnot give your community their experiences with your company, product, or services. This feedback guides improvement of the customer experience, and regardless of whether it's positive or negative, can empower positive change in any business and product. You're severely hampering that relationship with consumers and fans and the potential and quality in doing this. It's baffling ridiculously frustrating they continue to do this and reason with claiming they wouldn't surprise people by revisiting styles and wanting to create new experiences. Super Mario Odyssey revisits 64 and Sunshine Sandbox style but is a completely new experience in so many different ways. Zelda Breath of the Wild reuses so many ideas from the first Zelda while pertaining to 3D Zelda's core formula and redefining it in multiple ways without changing that style or genre to the detriment of its design or identity. Almost no Mario Kart feels the same despite how much their formula recycles, thanks to the physics, mechanics, modes, characters, and tracks they offer. They all offer new experiences in spite of recycling old formulas. That's what TTYD was to 64, and that's all we want a proper Paper Mario RPG 3 to do after TTYD. That's literally it. They claim to want to continuously make new experiences and not retread ground when Color Splash was for all intents and purposes in almost every single sense, Sticker Star 2. It was not new in almost any capacity for better or worse. The Origami King does do new stuff and ideas, but most of the same ideas and flaws between restrictions and gameplay of the last two games are still in Origami King. It's not done the series or fans any favors at all with these constant desires to make the series different from what it was constantly. Reminder, there's such a thing as a bad change. I don't know why that's ridiculously hard for some to fathom, but nothing in this world is inherently good for the sake of either existing or changing. Context matters. Opinions, feedback, and criticism exist based on those changes. No one experience will match anyone else's completely, and there will be different feelings and conclusions to those based on that, which could involve game design, writing, music, gameplay, story, anything. Just because it changes for the sake of it doesn't exempt it from any criticism, nor does it make it instinctively good. Smash Brothers doesn't get chastised for being the same game from 20 years ago when it comes to the core formula. 3D Mario and Pokemon continuously become critical acclaimed supersellers, and they almost never get ridiculed for following the same formula. No franchise like almost any other Mario subseries, or Fire Emblem, or Final Fantasy upon dozens of others fail or are critical bombs because they use that same formula. The innovation comes with what they can do to whatever style they inhibit. They adhere to the series identity and consumer feedback, something Paper Mario hasn't done for a long time. When Bug Fables innovates on TTYD's formula and multiple other indies are trying to do the same, it's unfair and ludicrous to assume the OG's Paper Mario style can't or would get stale, especially when these quote-unquote innovative changes fall flat due to the poor design. It becomes more challenging than it needs to be as a result, and all it's ever done was both throw Paper Mario in a ridiculous identity crisis and cause greater friction among fans and consumers more than ever. Moving on, they discuss how the battle system is about arranging concentric circles with enemies on them so that Mario deals the maximum damage. Can you talk about the reasons for the system and what the inspiration was for it? Tanabe then talks about how Aoyama came up with the inspiration during Color Splash and how it was inspired off of a Rubik's Cube. 
Then it follows into how characters folded turned evil, how they touch up on the horror aspect of Origami King, referencing the loss of ego used in horror movies, how Peach being folded represented that, and Tanabe expresses how he tries to make games for all audiences. Again, nothing new or worth discussing between both these points. But here's debatably the biggest piece of this interview. Eurogamer asks Tanabe and Nagaya, as part of Nintendo, Intelligent Systems naturally also feels a certain authorship over the characters in the Mario universe. But is there still an exchange in comparison with the creators behind the main series of Mario games to determine what works and what doesn't in the Mario context? Or does the Paper Mario team have sole control over the creative direction of the series? To which Tanabe replies, since Paper Mario Color Splash, we as a team have almost complete control over the creative direction of the game. Mr. Miyamoto took a look or two at the game's development, but there weren't any specific requests for changes. However, all character designs have to go through an examination by our IP team, and this is really strict. Nevertheless, this time we were allowed to change the outfits of some toads in the game. Right here. This specific detail. Now, it is officially confirmed. Between this, my Nikkei interview referenced in White Paper Mario refuses to change, and Miyamoto's lack of involvement in most games this entire decade, Miyamoto literally has nothing to do with Paper Mario, especially after Sticker Star. Color Splash onward, Intelligent Systems had almost complete creative freedom over these games. Their directions, their theme, style, storytelling, gameplay, everything. It's all Intelligent Systems. Tanabe having more influence along with the others, the directors, writers, and other big developers on the recent games, but it is Intelligent Systems at the end of it. What's more is there is an IP team reviewing character design, so there are restrictions that go through an IP team like it was discussed in the other video. Nagaya continues with, for control over the creative direction in relation to the parts of the game that make the game what it is, I totally agree with Mr. Tanabe. We kept checking that our focus wasn't too distant from the Mario universe. When developing the game content, we also made sure not to disappoint the player's expectations of the Mario universe. As mentioned earlier, there are strict guidelines in terms of how to deal with the characters. It was a challenge to highlight the unique style of the game while adhering to the guidelines. Now there are two things about this that still strike questions with this specific piece. One. Why is this a strict thing when the liberal character creations weren't an issue before? It cements that there's an upper team looking at these and placing limits, but at the same time, no one complained about the original designs and characters for the older Paper Mario games. People still welcome creative liberties with old and new characters, so the fact they exist makes them feel unnecessary and not needed, topped off with Miyamoto expressing how he doesn't want Mario to be rigid and limited. Secondly, where's that line? They express limitations, but they still never explain where that line is. Super Mario Odyssey, 3D Mario in general, introduces new characters and modifications of old ones constantly, with little struggle and intense creative reign. Luigi's Mansion 3 does the same with the portrait ghost it reintroduces. Mario Kart nowadays, and Mario Kart Tour especially, modifies old characters all the time, between Baby Variant, Metal Variant, and Mario Kart Tour, with the insane number of costumes Mario, Peach, Rosalina, Daisy, Wario, etc. wear. I don't doubt there are restrictions at play with the character creativity, but there needs to be more transparency with what that limitation, where that line is. The age and gender thing makes some sense now, that's why Toadsworth isn't often around, why Toadette is the only female Toad now, as stupid as these restrictions are, now we know where they come from. But when you compare the various Toads of various attire and background in Paper Mario 64 and Thousand Year Door, or any new characters, to the ones from Origami King, or Super Mario Galaxy, Odyssey, even Mario and Luigi up until Paper Jam, it doesn't feel like it should be that far off from how creative or diverse the character list is from the OG games to where I feel they can do more. Even then, again, there shouldn't be a reason to limit gender and age varied Toads to begin with, upon other similar restrictions placed. Beyond the new characters and specific scenarios and interactions, that's exactly what breathes so much life and variety into the characters of Paper Mario. That's what people adore Paper Mario for. It gives these games more quality than otherwise. It still doesn't feel like a valid reason to limit creative freedom on these games as is. And I still feel like Intelligent Systems can do so much more with those characters, new and old, even with these limits, like Mario Tennis, Odyssey, Luigi's Mansion, and Kart. Half of these franchises do plenty with pre-established characters as is with these limits that I think they could do much more with Paper Mario even under those limits. I'm assuming Odyssey's the exception because it's made in-house at Nintendo, but when past games have thrived from those creative liberties and when 3D Mario at least is celebrating in it, why make those limits to begin with? 
Why stagnate and hamper development and creative freedom when it was not only a non-issue to many consumers and supporters of these games, but when it benefit the developers and franchises immensely? I know you gotta have some limits like probably not make Mario M-rated, have heavy sexual themes or graphic violence or anything with a T rating or higher, discounting Smash Bros before 4. Limits like that I can understand, but the gender and age variation limit, the unique designs and expressions of original, new and old characters is genuinely dumb. It doesn't harm the brand, nor the consumer, nor developer. It's expanded these worlds, it's made these games so much better than ever. Certain Mario games get away with it scot-free, and others have done it prior to these limits. It has no reason or place being in there, in my opinion. The last thing is Eurogamer asking whether or not the team had a passion for origami before or during development. Tanabe expresses how he and other Japanese children experienced folding origami growing up but it was largely the artists and developers tackling the aspect more. Nagaya mentioned how they didn't consider origami during the planning phase, but during the concept phase they considered the best way to incorporate origami elements. The character designers used real paper and made drafts to experiment, with the programmers putting a ton of work into authenticating the look and feel, which does genuinely show an origami king in my opinion. And that's the whole interview. Pretend this is like the very last origami king interview I cover in that other video. But this confirms there is a team of sorts setting limits, and now more than ever, which people should stop genuinely pretending otherwise, Miyamoto's influence on Paper Mario was ultimately significantly minor and he needs to stop being put as the blame. But those limits still have no reason being there given they've worked and are praised just fine, and the contention of having two Mario RPGs justifying changing an entire genre is still incredibly misplaced for various reasons. I'm not gonna go a whole lot further or reiterate more than what I already have in that video, but the reasons behind why Paper Mario is the way it is now, no Origami King interview thus far has made logical sense from a design and philosophical perspective. Now more than ever, Paper Mario still suffers from a major identity crisis, they still do not want to wrap their heads around that, nor their consumers and feedback as a general whole, and despite how flawed it is for them to stick to their guns like this, all these changes, interviews and ideas and whatnot have done nothing but both limit the creative direction and quality design of Paper Mario and creating ridiculous amounts of friction between the fans that's only going to get worse. It's still frustrating and baffling how much worse and worse each interview gets. But as far as the broader scope of the entire Paper Mario ordeal, in more thorough detail and thought, I still recommend why Paper Mario refuses to change for the entire debacle summed up, researched, explained, and argued. And hopefully that's the last interview I talk about and I don't gotta talk about Mario and Paper Mario and TOK for at least three years because I want to move on from this. I do plan on making a series involving just the first three games for the future regarding each game's chapter. That said though, thanks for watching and you're welcome to stick around for more Paper Mario content, Mario content, and general Nintendo coverage and gameplay including streams. Stay super.